We began speaking some time ago about the words of the apostles saying, after my departure, where Peter knew that his life was coming to an end, and he closed that in Second Peter 1 and 3 as well. Um, or Paul said that he also would be departing and they'd not hear from him again in Acts 20 to the uh, elders at Ephesus. The apostles were aware that they were leaving, and the apostles were aware that they were writing Scripture, and they named no successors. They pointed us back to the Word of God, which is able to give us the inheritance. But we need to keep going in our study because um, there is a religion that emerges very clearly by about 300 A.D., let's say, And we ought to look at that and understand that and see what's happening there. Because uh, this religion is something that history terms Christianity. Um, that's the term that they use for it. They call it Christianity. The apostles of the Lord, as you and I know, were adults when Jesus was teaching on earth in about 30 AD. So, you know, they were all dead by about 100 AD, his, you know, if history is right, they were dead before that, uh, maybe as much as 30 years before that, not clear. But whatever it is, we know that, that there's a pretty finite limit on how long were the apostles around, probably around 100 AD, let's say. And certainly, on the other hand, if you look at a couple of centuries later, by 300 AD, there is this very reliable historic historical record of a religion that they call Christianity at that time. And this Christianity religion is something that is recognizable and that has these kind of enduring marks of what is this? And so it raises to me this thought of, well, between the time of the apostles and what you read in your New Testament, and say about 300-ish A.D. with Christianity, what happened here? What is the difference between these things, and how did this come about? What came to be? And what is that? Well, about 300 A.D. is where we're placing the reign of Emperor Constantine of Rome. And the significance of this, again, is that it's a snapshot of what that religion looked like at that point in time. We have a clear indication, and I wanted to present that to you to show you what, from sources, uh, both secular and religious, but nonetheless historic or historical sources, what was happening in the time of Constantine. And the reason for showing this to you is because there was something happening. There was something clear, definitive, distinctive that was happening there. And there's a clear contrast between that and the New Testament. So I'm setting that as kind of the upper boundary. Like by the time 300 comes around, here is this religion called Christianity. And here are the features of this religion. I don't really care what happens after that. I'm curious to know how did we get there. After that, you know, all bets are off. But how did we get there? Where is there? Well, there is a there there. Constantine the first of Rome, is born in the late part of the 200s and uh, died in 337 AD. He became full-fledged emperor in about 312, although there's a little bit, you know, it's always complicated. They didn't have these, you know, peaceful transitions of power <laughs> that we have. <laughs> they, uh, it was a little more complicated than that, but, you know, somewhere around 300. 
He's the first Roman emperor to profess Christianity, according to Encyclopedia Britannica, which is nominally a secular source. I say nominally because of, you know, my own biases against their, uh, I guess, what I would say is their true professed religion, but that's all right. They're supposed to be a secular source, and <laughs> they're supposed to be providing this um, from a viewpoint of, you know, England. And to be fair, when you're thinking about Britannica and the Britons in general, you know, the English really want the Catholic Church to be Roman, okay? And they really want Constantine to be the founder of the Catholic Church. So you keep that in mind when you're reading what they're saying. That's fair. And uh, yet, you know, the birth and the death, the dates of this man and his profession of a religion called Christianity are facts. They're friendly. But I decided, you know, I should ask the Catholics what they think about this too. And I did find a good quality, you know, the New Advent Catholic Encyclopedia, which um, was in my home growing up, you know, and... My mom, my mother had been in the convent, so you know that's that's pretty legit. The the actual, you know, the commentary or the the encyclopedia itself had an imprimatur. This thing online is just like facsimile. I'm not sure they have an imprimatur. I don't even know if they do that for online stuff, or if they do that anymore. Period. But um, I thought, well, let let them speak too. You're going to get somebody who is potentially the enemy of the Catholic Church. Well, okay, let's hear from the Catholics on the matter too, right? That's what I was thinking, was let's bring together the secular and the religious because I just really want to look at the facts of what was this thing at this point in time. What are the characteristics and features of this thing? Undisputed. <clears throat> and, you know, to be fair, I think that... Uh, the Catholic Encyclopedia wants to distance themselves from Constantine. I'm actually persuaded by them, to be honest. I think they're probably right. I mean, if, if they're the Catholics and they're the Catholic Church and they say Constantine wasn't Catholic, well, he probably wasn't, <laughs> you know. <laughs> That's okay. Um, like people today wondering about the Pope changing the Catholic Church. No, I think he's Catholic. The Pope is Catholic, I'm pretty sure, you know. Um, they said Constantine turned the history of the world into a new course and made Christianity, which until then had suffered bloody persecution, the religion of the state. That's the Catholic version of this. And it's true. Constantine did change the history of the world. He is, you know, the start of that Byzantine empire and bureaucracy, however you like to look at that. Um, but both Britannica and New Advent describe it as a religion, describe it as a new course in history, and yes, they call it Christianity. Was Constantine a Catholic? I don't care. It doesn't matter whether he was or not. That's not the point. The point is that history, secular and religious, are completely agreed. What you're looking for is what do they assume? What are known to be the facts? The facts are there was a religion called Christianity. And that religion has been in existence since at least the time that they captured it in the days of Constantine. That's the point. I don't care whether he was or he wasn't, you know, uh, they tell us that he uh, refused baptism because he knew that being the emperor was going to uh, include doing a whole lot of things that a baptized Catholic wouldn't be allowed to do, and that he chose to be baptized on his deathbed, uh, you know, whatever. They can argue about those things. I don't care. Either way is fine with, us, with me. My point is, they're all agreed. There's this new religion. And it's called Christianity. 
Now, the reason that I'm calling it this, and I want to, I guess I'm, I'm polemical about it, um, is because Christianity is what they call it. But you'll never see the word Christianity in the Bible. Because that's not what it's called in the Bible. And I think that's probably good. Because that's not what it is. So what are the features, right? Between the two of them, we have a pretty good capture. This thing they call Christianity, it's actually quite familiar to you and me today. We moderns recognize it. These features are distinctive, and these features are lasting. In other words. So the Brits say this. Statue set up on his becoming emperor in 312 showed Constantine himself holding aloft a cross and the legend, quote, by this saving sign I've delivered your city from the tyrant and restored liberty to the Senate and people of Rome. Right, yeah, Jesus used SPQR, sure. Okay, but this uh, idea is set in stone. <laughs> the reason I've captured this, and this is a quote from Britannica, the reason I've captured this is because it's archaeological fact. You can prove this. You can see that that's exactly what they've got. There is a statue. There is... Um, a fresco or whatever that is, uh, maybe in relief, um, showing him, and he's holding a cross, and there's a sign, a legend, uh, you know, describing what's happening there, that he has this icon, both the cross that he's holding up and the sign that you'll be delivered. Right at 312 A.D., we have the date. The, this guy is holding up a cross. This guy thinks he's getting a sign from heaven. And the Brits tell us about the historian Eusebius, who was also very religious. A religious historian, ecclesiastical, ecclesiastical history, however you want to describe it. He said... There is a vision seen by Constantine in which the Christian sign appeared in the sky with the legend, in this sign I conquer. It's very similar to the, uh, the statue and the fresco we just described, that there is this vision, there's this sign in the sky. The contemporaneous Eusebius, I meant to tell you, the reason he's important is because he was alive at the time of Constantine. He may well have taught Constantine, in the late 200s, and be part of the reason that Constantine became very seriously and genuinely religious. And he said that Constantine had a vision, and he saw this Christian sign. Christian sign, which is part of the religion of Christianity. This statement is important because Eusebius is a contemporaneous historian who's capturing this. And the Brits further tell us that there's another guy, Lactantius, a Christian apologist, who tells us that Constantine received instructions in a dream to paint the Christian monogram on his troops' shields. The monogram is the thing that looks like a little X with a tall P coming out of it, which is actually a chi and a rho. They're the first two letters of the word Christ in Greek. Why the first two letters? I don't know. Why do you call it a monogram when it actually has two grams? I have no idea. Don't ask. I don't know. But you recognize that symbol. You see it all over the place on churches today and in religious books and in religious art. So you have an another party. You have the history books. You have Eusebius. You have Lactantius. They're all of them saying this man whose religion is Christianity, had a vision or a dream or something where there was a sign, and it included the use of these icons, the 
cross, the letters of Jesus' name, right? The Brits do that, and they would. But even in New Advent, the Catholics say, a vision had assured him that, this, that he should conquer in the sign of the Christ, and his warriors carried Christ's monogram on their shields, although most of them were pagans. Okay, that's fine. Uh, that can all be pagans. That's fine by me. Uh, I don't see any difference. But the vision and the sign and the monogram, they're in agreement. They are, agree they are agreed. Constantine's religion, between the, the seculars and the religious, Constantine's Christianity was a religion that embraced visions and signs and icons. They've already got the letters, the crosses, uh, the heavenly, the heavens open up and people seeing things. That, at about 300 AD, is already the established, the norm, the acceptable. It's what the artists are carving. This is the existing religion. That's my point. Do you recognize those things? I recognize those things. They're quite familiar. But there's more. Britannica, the Brits, tell us about Constantine's prodigious building projects. The basilicas, you know, these massive churches, ornate buildings made of expensive materials, precious metals and stones. Right. They said Constantine instigated the building of a great new basilica, which was what we know as the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem. Offering unlimited help with labor and materials and suggestions as to design and decoration. The emperor of Rome used imperial funds to erect these rather expensive buildings and basilicas many of which survive. Okay? And not just the Church of the Holy Sepulchre at Jerusalem, but also the Church of the Holy Wisdom and the Church of the Apostles in Constantinople. Istanbul was Constantinople. Now it's Istanbul. The Church of St. Peter in Rome, which was replaced in the 1600s, to be fair, the current Peter's Basilica is a 1600s building, but the original was Constantine's. And lots of churches in lots of other places in the Near East. He used imperial funds to do this. He supported the building of all of these very expensive buildings, uh, the expensive materials, the precious metals, the land, you know, the real estate. And yes, his mother took a, a pilgrimage to the Holy Land, Constantine's mother. She was the reason that that church was built, that Holy Church of the Sepulchre, um, and others. She's the one who is credited by the Catholics with erecting churches on the hallowed spots in Palestine. Palestine. Uh, they said Constantine the Great had a magnificent basilica erected over the grave of St. Peter at the foot of the Vatican Hill. Um, and there's a, there's a lengthy article about the dispute over Peter's body, where that was buried, but they're sure that that's where it was, and that's why he built the church there. But again, he's using the imperial funds to erect that. And as I said before, uh, whether you believe the secularist ideas or whether you believe the Catholics' ideas is immaterial, look at what they're assuming to be fact between the two of them, and that is that the Christianity of the day of Constantine embraced these ornate, precious buildings. That's interesting. And there's more. Britannica tells us that it is the religion of the state in a specific way. Now, the, the Catholic Encyclopedia had given that as the summary of Constantine's life, that he made it the religion of the state. 
Here we have some specifics in Britannica, in addition to his funding. Um, Britannica records that at 313, Constantine had already donated to the Bishop of Rome the imperial property of the Lateran, where a new cathedral, the Basilica Constantiniana, soon rose. So here he's donating directly to somebody who claims to be the bishop of Rome, not one of the bishops of the congregation, but the bishop of Rome. That's also interesting. He donated an imperial property, meaning he used the Roman government property for the construction of cathedrals and basilicas. And New Advent records that by 318, he had gotten laws passed, many laws passed that were placing you know, Christian bishops as authorities in the state of Rome. The law of 318 denied the competence of a civil court to continue to rule if in a suit an appeal was made to the court of a Christian bishop what they're saying is he made the Christian bishop the court of appeals for any civil court. So anybody in Rome who had a matter in court but could appeal to a Christian bishop, that would take precedent. That was authoritative. Should he have done that? You know, depends, right? The Britannica wants to say, oh yeah, he is doing what he was supposed to do. He's the founder. Catholics are saying, eh, he's overstepping his boundaries, he shouldn't have done it. But both of them are telling you the same thing. The Christianity of Constantine's day embraced support and participation with the state. They were commingled with the government. They're part of it, part and parcel. The government is supporting it. The government is building it. The government has something to do with their appointments. Government officials are known in history to have done a lot better in the court of Constantine if they themselves were to find that, hey, this Christianity stuff, it's pretty good. I, I think that I believe this now. And then things go better for them. That is the religion of 300 AD, a religion that embraces icons and signs and visions, a religion that um, embraces ornate, expensive buildings made of precious stones and metals, a religion that accepts and participates in the government of Rome, the secular government. This is the religion that both the secularists and the religionists call Christianity. So we should look at the Bible on this. And actually, there's not very much to say. So don't worry too much. Galatians 6 is the first place. But look at this. What we're saying is already, not 200 years after these apostles are gone, there is a religion that history recognizes. There is a religion that they call Christian. And it is not the religion of the Bible. Whether it's Catholic or not, I'm not interested in debating that. But I know what it, what it isn't. It's not the Church of Christ. That's not what the Bible teaches at all. In Galatians 6, at 15 down through 17, Paul said, In Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but a new creation. As many as walk according to this rule, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. Now on, from now on, let no one trouble me, for I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. What does this mean? Well, it means physical tokens are of no value. Icons are meaningless. 
The marks of Jesus on the body of Paul are not the stigmata as so many suspicious, superstitious people do. Uh, it's the persecutions that he endures. How many times has he been stoned? Has he been beaten? Has he been whipped? Has he been left for dead? Yes, he has scars. They're the scars of the persecution of the faithful. Icons are meaningless. If you want a physical token, if you want some kind of a show, look at Paul's stripes. That's what he's saying. And truly, there could be no greater meaning than for you to live for God, even if it means that you suffer for him. The icons, bah. They don't exist in the New Testament. They're not authorized. And as you can see, they're useless. They're no more helpful than circumcision. Over in Acts 14. It said there, the apostles after first having gone and preached to many cities and established churches there, went back the way, they followed the, the route they had come through and went back and stopped along these churches, strengthening them, exhorting them to continue in the faith, Acts 14.22 tells us. And in verse 23 it says, When they had appointed elders in every church and prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord in whom they had believed. The New Testament says, Every church had elders appointed in it. That's the New Testament order. And these elders were committed to the Lord. What does it mean? It means the churches report directly to God. In no place does it say they set up a bishop of Rome or a bishop of Antioch or Iconium or Lystra But bishops, elders, overseers, in the plural, in every individual church. And these were committed to the Lord. They reported directly to God. So when we look at the historical record of the oversight coming from governing authorities, in addition to singularly named bishops over large areas, that's not biblical. That's not what the apostles set up. Even in the apostles' day, they didn't retain some kind of title or authority over them. They committed these churches to the Lord. And Paul, when he was dying in Acts 20, told the, told the uh, uh, Ephesian elders, you're not going to see me again. And now I commend you to the Lord and to the word of his grace. He named no successor, right? Right? He didn't retain anything over them. He said, you turn to the Bible. It has all the answers you need. The churches report to God. Over in the book of Acts in chapter 4 is where we first start to see the collection of monies in the churches, at least the record of it. And at that time, what you find is that individuals decided to sell things. Individuals took the proceeds of their sales and brought those things and laid them at the apostles' feet, Acts 4.35, from which it had been distributed or would be distributed to anybody whenever the need might arise. The money was brought by individuals whenever they were prospered, and they gave it, and it was laid at the apostles' feet, meaning it's governed by the doctrine of the apostles. But it was there so that it would exist to meet needs as they might arise over time. That's the meaning of a treasury. <laughs> and over at 1 Corinthians 16, you know, he said that each one of you is to put aside and to save regarding the collection on the first day of the week. Individual members are where money comes from for the work of the Lord. Individual members are prospered by God 
Individual members give up their own things and give back to the Lord of their own free will. There is nothing in the New Testament of the churches accepting money from governing, governing authority from the state in whatever states they may have been in. That's not New Testament. Any idea that they're accepting land grants and parts and labor at skilled artisans is completely foreign to the New Testament. It's just not in there. People ask me sometimes, what was the silver bullet? What, what helped you to see? You're like, well, the silver bullet was reading the Bible. I hadn't done that before. What you do is you read this book, and you will realize, as I did, by about, I started in Matthew 1, by about Matthew chapter 5, chapter 6 at the latest. I already knew right then and there, this is not what I have believed. This isn't what I've been doing. That's what you do. You read the Bible. And over in Acts chapter 2, did they have somewhere to meet? Well, yes, they did. Did they pay for it? They must have paid for it. You're not going to gather a crowd of thousands in public free of charge. That just doesn't exist anywhere. <laughs> you got to pay something, even if it's trash pickup or security detail or security deposit. You got to pay something. Yes, they paid something. It's acceptable for the church to pay for somewhere to meet. That's fine. But notice what they did, though. It's recorded there in Acts 2, 46, that uh, these, the apostles, or I'm sorry, the apostles and all the people, thousands of them at this point, continue daily with one accord in the temple. They attended the temple together daily, though they numbered in the thousands, but they're functionally meeting. There is a temple and there is an open plaza in the temple where they can gather, and they do. Specifically, Acts 5, by the time that their number is significant, I mean, by the time you get to Acts 5, it, we've looked at this before, but Acts 2, 3,000 husbands obeyed the gospel. How many women, how many children? We don't know. And then the number of husbands increases to some 5,000. And then there's another place where it says the number grew still more and more. How many people are we talking about? Thousands of people. 10,000, 20, 30,000 people by the time you're here in Acts 5. And they're all together in Solomon's portico. You have tens of thousands of people and they haven't built a cathedral? No. They haven't sought some land outside the city where they could put together a meeting place? No. There's already a spot that they can meet in. They just, they're just paying rent or something. Like I said, some security deposit, some trash detail, security detail, something to meet in Solomon's portico. My point is, it's functional. It's not about the building. It's functional. They met. They needed to met. They took care of the need. But they focused on the praises of God and on the teaching of his word. That's the church of the New Testament. That's the church of Christ. What you're finding then is that the religion of Constantine is Christianity, but it's not the Church of Christ. And what people call Christianity, that's the religions of man. 
That's not the religions of the Bible. That's not the religion of God. I think too many, too many, even today, in the churches of Christ, the Christians, they make the mistake of believing that Christianity, as captured by the historians, is original. It's not. It never was. Oh, it's the one that they think is original. It's the one that they record. It's the one to which they have attestation, both from secularists and religionists. But it's not the religion of the Bible, and it never was. It never had anything to do with the Bible. And as for the claims that, you know, this call for the authority of Scripture didn't happen until the Reformation of the 1600s uh, and all the Protestant churches. You know, this is nothing but Catholicism. No, the Bible is right, and the Bible has always been right, and the apostles clearly said they would write these things down, and they clearly referred us to the writings. The Catholics call it sola scriptura, or maybe the Protestants called it that. Whatever. Protestants or Catholics is what I'm saying to you, friends. <laughs> Protestants are Catholics. They're stepping away from the Catholic religion, which may well be the religion of Constantine. It may be what they're calling Christianity in the history books. But it's not what you read about in the Bible. Don't make the mistake of thinking that that's original. And by the way, whew, a couple of hundred years ago, right, this country started, didn't it? Yeah. How long do you think it's going to take? Or don't you realize that it has already happened? Right? How long is it going to take before there's a false religion that started as the Church of Christ and still wears its name? Don't you know that's already happened? That's what's happened in this country. That's what's happened. That's where we're at. And it really differs in almost no way. We're going to keep going in the study looking at um, the writings of people who came between 100 A.D. and, two, and 300 A.D. Look at what they wrote. Um, there's a fellow writing in, probably in the 90s A.D. It's pretty incredible. The way he writes sounds... I mean, if you didn't know the Bible you would think it was the Bible. What he writes sounds like a letter of Paul. And he quotes from Paul extensively. If you didn't know the Bible, it would be very confusing. All the way up to about 200, where it's much more like the religion of Constantine's day, and it's very clear that this ain't the same thing. This is not even close to the same thing. That first guy, he's very interesting. We're going to look at that. But I'm telling you, friends, already in the studies, looking at what they're saying, I recognize that. Oh, yes. I recognize that. I've heard all of that. Oh, yes. The churches are saying the exact same things. So we've got to stick with the Bible. Now, 1 Timothy 2, for our invitation, the... While we reject this idea that, you know, the church is governed by uh, the state or that the state should be subject to the church um, and have the, you know, the elders of the church have some kind of civil authority, we do reject that. The scriptures don't teach it. Jesus wouldn't even, Jesus wouldn't even help a man with his inheritance, remember? Tell my brother to split the inheritance with me. He said, man, who made me an arbiter? He's not even going to help you with your personal inheritance. He certainly wants no part of your government. 
okay? Jesus is not running for president. He never has. However, the Bible does say this. In 1 Timothy 2, I exhort first of all that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, kings and all in authority, that we may lead a quiet, peaceable life in all godliness and reverence, for this is good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. God is not the enemy of the state, even though he refuses to participate in the state. He's not the enemy of the state. We pray for everybody, and we pray for our state. We pray for our governing authorities. He's been very explicit about this. So we pray for kings and all who are in high positions, and that's true. And you better do it, Christian friend, and you better do it sincerely. They need our prayers. There are some Christians in office, I'm sure, but you know the people, the incoming administration, the outgoing administration, they're not made of Christians by and large. They don't know. They need prayers like anybody else. Because God wants everybody to be saved. God wants us to take all the opportunities. If you're asked to pray, pray. If you have a chance, you know, to talk about the Bible, talk about the Bible. Can you invite somebody to church? Can you invite somebody to, to open the Bible with you? You know? Do it. This is good and pleasing in the sight of God who desires all people to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. We pray for all of these and genuinely that we might teach all of these. And even if, you know, they don't always do what they should do, I know that's true. Of course they don't and they never have. <laughs> but we pray for them and we hope that they will. And wouldn't that be a good thing if they did? There was once a secular leader, if you will. There was once a leader of Israel who was dead set against the church. He even persecuted them to the death. That man was Saul of Tarsus, right? But somebody taught him. Somebody reached out to him. He repented. He humbled himself. And he became the Apostle Paul. He was shown mercy because God can show mercy. And things can really change. The most unlikely of people can obey the gospel because God raises the dead. That's what he does. If today you are not a Christian, become a Christian that you might have this for yourself. We appeal to the authority of Scripture because this is about honesty. This is about integrity. This is about being truthful with what God says and with ourselves and being ready for the judgment day. Are you today a Christian? Put him on in baptism for forgiveness of sins. Become a child of God according to the New Testament. Are you a Christian who has not lived right? Repent. Put God first. Let us pray with you and for you that you can be restored to him. Either way, take advantage of the grace of God. Let your need be known by coming to the front while we stand, while we sing.